here at USC, and it's great to see so many of our students here. And um, uh, thank you to Gina and I, our treasured faculty member, for putting together this evening's uh, panel discussion. And she'll be introducing her panelists. Uh, but before we begin, I wanted to make a few announcements. Cell phone, off, double check. Um, and we have a few events. Well, several events upcoming in our program, and the schedule is outside, but I'll just mention a few events that are, that are coming up that you might want to remember. Um, we have a reading and conversation with Megan Dahm on Monday, March 22nd, and that will be uh, moderated by Dinah Lenny. On March 26th, we have a student faculty reading at the Barnes & Noble at the Grove. Is that right, Tom? Yes. Is it Coleman who's reading? Yes. Coleman Huff, who's a screenwriter who teaches in our program. Uh, she's collaborated with Steven Soderbergh on a couple of films. Um, my favorite is Bubble, about the doll factory. So um, Coleman Huff will be reading with several students. Anybody know who's reading that night, Tom? The yeah. students? Um. Rob Boyd. Um, Anyone here reading that night? Well, you'll still, we get these huge audiences at the, the Grove, so be sure to check out your classmates. Um, on Friday and Saturday, April 2nd and 3rd, we have the Dramatic Readings Festival. And the winners of this, year comp this year's competition are Kevin Avery, uh, Tom Rastrelli, and Marlene, Marlene Leach. And they'll be um, receiving uh, staged readings with directors and um, actors, and it'll be wonderful. And there are two screenplays and one stage play that are being done. Um, and then on April 5th, I'm inter interviewing Sapphire at Aloud, and then she's also coming on campus to do a, a conversation with all of you. And, um, We'll be reading her book, Push, in core, so if anyone wants to join us, uh, that would be great. And um, so without uh, any further announcements, as everyone settles, I will turn the evening over to the capable hands of Jimena Hines. Thank you so much. Hello. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much, Bridget, for doing this. And. Uh, and Ebony, even though she's not talking, she's busy, but uh, she's had hell with the parking today. But anyway, uh, so the, thank you guys, really, from the bottom of my heart. It's so nice of you to do this. So the, the purpose uh, of the panel, I hope, is to give uh, um, the writers in the audience an idea of what the market looks like in, uh, uh, in each area, because each one of you is working in a different area of writing and, uh, and the internet, and to give them an idea of what, what the market looks like, and to give them an idea of how to navigate, how to position themselves now while they're still students, they were grad students while they're students, so that in a year or two years when they graduate, they, they, they have a sense of direction and, and a place that, you know, so, some way to move forward. Uh, partly, uh, those of us who teach here are, are novices. We're not, we haven't caught up to you guys. We're novices in, 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 in this transition. And that we still know about the old methods. And so uh, it would be great for them to hear from people like yourselves who have already made the transition. So I will, um, I'll direct specific questions to each of you, um, and, and then I'll, I'll just give a brief introduction when, uh, when I ask the question, and we might as well, I thought we might start with Johanna, who is Deputy Director of the Norman Lear Center. You have the long bio on the sheets that you got. Um, that's based at the Annenberg School. She has a PhD in English from the University of California, Santa Barbara, so she did transition from academia to this world, and has held a variety of positions within the tech industry, including web producer and digital archivist at Vivendi Universal Games. And she's on the board of Lefty Press, a venue for literary experimentation. Uh, so, Johanna, I'll, I'll start with um, by asking you, 
uh, how you made this transition, or, or, or did you ever work in academia, and uh, uh, why? And also a little bit about the work that you do, this research that you've done recently that we were talking about earlier. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll stick with the first half of that sure. question for the moment. Um, I was in an English program, a PhD program at UC Santa Barbara, and I was working on a modernist dissertation, and one of my dissertation committee members, who was a Wordsworth scholar, was also a geek. And uh, Netscape had just launched. This was probably in 1994 or 95. And he took me to his computer, and he took me on a tour of the Louvre Museum. And I actually cried. <laughs> I couldn't believe that there was now this graphical user interface for this online uh, tool that I'd been using for some time. I had worked in interlibrary loan departments, and I had been doing email, actually, since 1986. But it was just uh, university-oriented email, and it was always only text. So I saw these images, and I thought, this is like a virtual visit to a museum in France that I will probably never see. I can never afford to go there. And it really clicked a switch in my mind. I thought, I'm writing for such a tiny audience with my dissertation, which is about Gertrude Stein and Mina Loy and all these modernists. Nobody's going to read my book. But if I posted it on this world, I bet people would see it. And I became very passionate about it. I started teaching classes to students on how to do research on the humanities online. And that gave me some web chops. I, I learned HTML. I started writing websites. And um, I had an opportunity to get a job at a web startup instead of doing my basic graduate teaching fellow duties um, in probably the final year of my dissertation. And I took it, and boy, suddenly my career just went on a completely different path. I finished my dissertation while I was working at a game company, Vivendi Universal. As an English PhD, working in research and development in an edutainment CD-ROM company. And I felt like I was getting my second PhD. I was learning about coding. I was learning about digital art, I was learning about 3D, and I was learning about interactivity. How do you tell a story and allow people who are reading that story to actually do something and to change that story as they're experiencing it? And so it was a whole other level of education for me, and um, I'm happy that I came back to the university by working at a place at the Norman Lear Center, but it was, I think I needed to take that journey out into the multimedia industry and into the web industry first in order to really be able to appreciate the future of academe. Because whether you want to or not, your work is going to be online in the future. And if you don't learn what that means now and how to do it yourself now, to learn the tools to publish yourself online now, I think you'll be at a, at a severe disadvantage. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, OK, Tom Lotz on my immediate left is the, the chair, is a professor and a chair of the writing department at Creative Writing Department at UC Riverside. Uh, he has served as acting director for the MFA program and visiting professor of clinical studies at the California Institute of the Arts. This is very impressive. Just, you know. And he's also a writer. Um, his last book, I love that title, is Doing Nothing, A History of Loafers, Loungers, Slackers, and Bums in America. Sounds like writers. <laughs> and he has also, uh, he is about to launch an online book review called the Los Angeles Review of Books. So Tom, can you tell our, our students, please, uh, how you transitioned, or why did you decide to get into the book review business? Well, I guess I should come out right away as a lover of the book. <laughs> I am, I, Confess. I, 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 my, my story is a little, a little different than Joanna's. I, I was a wandering hippie drug addict, and I ended up at cooking in a kitchen at a college, um, where I bumped into a couple of professors, and I found out that they read books for a living, and I thought, I, I have to figure out how to get into this line of work. <laughs> And so I started going to college and started going to graduate school and, and stayed, stayed with it. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the online world for the reasons that everybody is interested in it, in, in relation to, to the book, um, because it, uh, it, is, um, it is changing every, the way everybody is doing business. is changing the way I'm, and I'm most concerned. I mean, my, my main uh, my wife was a freelance journalist, which means that she's um, her, She's working for one tenth of what she was working for 
10 years ago. And, uh, and, and I'm interested in how writers are going to get paid in the future, how writers are going to be able to make a living in the future. And so um, the, the book review is just fun. My, my little way to try, try to get some money together and funnel it back to writers to talk about books um, and help keep book culture alive. Um, Whatever that means, book culture. They, they you mean you think book review is going to make money? No, the, the, the book review is is, uh, is a, a, a public good. Uh, it's a public service, and uh, I'm raising funding uh, on that basis. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm, it will never make money. It will, it will, <laughs> it will I hope, pull in some money in advertising, pull in some money in click through sales, and, um, and that kind of thing. But it's it's um, it's a, it's a curated, edited site. It's not a, it's not a Social networking site or not a primarily social networking site, and it's, so it's not going to get the kind of traffic that that, that, that Otis and Elizabeth can get. It's not going to. It's not going to. I don't think ever um, be that 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 uh, have the kind of click through rate that a, that a site that can make money. Um, I think it, I, I, I'm hoping it will be immediately important to book to the literary ones, and book book, digital ads, catalog, but um, but it's it's, uh, it's going to require grants and gifts forever. Take notice, guys. Um, Jim Rainey is a, a writer, a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. He uh, covers uh, technology. Uh, he has a column that covers technology. And uh, so I guess if you tell us a little bit about what you have learned, how long you've been in the business, and what you've learned uh, about uh, what lurks ahead, what moves ahead, and how you think writers, uh, journalists, are going to get paid in the future. That would be great. Sure. Uh, is this where I lodge my protest for my painfully short biography here? <laughs> no, this, uh, I, this, this is complaint? my revenge. Yes. I was emailing you and asking for I didn't answer. a bio. <laughs> that would be me, all right. <laughs> Can you ever see this? Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody else has got these very meaty with the you dead notes. Even, I have to I've got, I've got like one line sketch. here. That's what I've got, one Just line. Tell us what <laughs> uh, I actually know not, almost nothing about technology, actually. I, I write a column called On the Media, and I. Uh, it's really about the state of journalism in its many manifestations, whether it's the printed version, which if you get the Los Angeles Times, you see uh, where we're headed recently. We had Johnny Depp on the front page in full Technicolor and an advertisement covering what was supposed to look like the front page. Anybody see that? Yes. Uh, that gives you an idea of what's uh, happening in terms of the struggles of the old media to make money. Uh, and it is a struggle. Uh, so I, what I do spend a lot of time doing, though, is, is looking at new ways to try and make money in journalism. And frankly, it's we're in the middle of a revolution, and so I'd love to come here tonight and tell you people figured it out. A few people have figured it out, but it's it's a revolution, so it's a big mess. And uh, some people are doing all right. A lot of people are struggling, like uh, he's referring to it as wife. I, in fact, I wrote a piece a few weeks ago that got a huge response writing about freelance writing and photography. Photographers in particular, if you folks know any professional photographers, are just taking a massive beating right now because it's so easy. Uh, it's a great, I mean, we all love the internet because it's easy access to everything in the world. But a few years back, a photographer had ownership of their material and they could make quite a bit of money by keeping ownership. Now they thought, and we thought as newspaper people, we'll put everything out there for free and you guys know the rest of the story. Now everything, the price of everything has gone just way, way down. And it's, so it is a struggle to make money in these creative professions. But I mean, the reason we're here is to not make you hopeless. I think it's to give you hope. And so what I do see is that people who are really passionate about what they do can still make money. I'll give you just one example that mm -hmm. I want to glitter on. Uh, there's a guy here in LA, excuse me, his name's Don Barrett. He's, I think, in his early 70s. Uh, so he's not a new, you know, 18-year-old tech genius, but he's a guy who loves radio, and he particularly loved Southern California radio all his life. He listened to the DJs and everything, and he's just fascinated with it. So he started a website called LA Radio, and if you like radio in Los Angeles, you really probably should go on LA Radio and uh, read up about everyone who's on the air, all the behind-the-scenes people, all the trends in terms of business, in terms of content. 
And what he's done is he put up a, what you're not supposed to do. He put up a paywall uh, to block off quite a bit of the content unless you pay him. And he's getting, I think it's forty nine ninety nine a year. But he's got several thousand uh, passionate people. So at 50 bucks a head, if you get a thousand people, you got $50,000. You can do the math from there. And he's apparently found enough people out there that he can make a living writing about something he cares about. So, I mean, that's just one example. People are doing that kind of thing now. And the, the key, I think, which maybe, you know, Otis can, is going to talk about is finding a niche that's a high passion niche. And hopefully it's your own passion. If you have to get into uh, something that you don't care about, it's going to be very hard to make one of these enterprises go. Because at the front end, it's hugely labor intensive is one of the things I've learned. So. Uh, I mean, we can talk more about other examples, but that's one example of a guy who's here, and he's again, he's not a tech genius. He's an older guy, but he just he loved this field, and he's put his heart and soul into it, and he's making a go of it. So, there you have it. Okay, hey, wonderful. We'll talk more about that. Thank you so much. Um, Swade Kaufman is actually a graduate of the USC Annenberg School of Journalism. She's publisher of truthstick.com, and uh, um, there's a, she's just started, she's just publishing a book with Nation Books, which I think is really, really exciting, with Nation Books, right, mm -hmm. that I hope you will talk about. But Suez, uh, can you just tell us how and why you got into the online uh, kind of journalism? I mean, you know, and um, okay, yeah. how it's going? First of all, I would say that anything anyone tells you here is could well change and everything's in complete flux and it keeps staying in flux. We've been, I was a, I used to be a journalist for the LA Times, I was with West Side Weekly. It was, um, and then uh, Bob Shear, he's, um, we partnered. I had been his researcher and then I was hired as a full-time uh, reporter. And then when um, the Chicago uh, Tribune bought the LA Times and was getting rid of, we were doing local in Santa Monica, um, we looked at possibly buying uh, some newspapers and continuing that way. And we did the numbers and we were, it just didn't look like newspapers was where it was going to go. But I don't think anybody imagined the demise that <laughs> that happened afterwards. But anyway, we, we decided to go ahead and uh, start a website. And um, Truth Dig, uh, and at that time, you know, we've been looking at different models. We've been, and I could talk about a lot of things, because that's what I do all day long, is trying to figure out which models work and looking at where it works. And, and uh, I mean, that's one of the things I do. But um, Truth Dig, you know, what our primary goal was when we were going to the web um, was how do we establish credibility on the web? We didn't want to just you know be a rant or a, considered a blog, and um, so we were very careful in hiring copy editors, hiring reporters, and in fact, we were only one year in, and we won. Um, we were we won best political blog, which we were up against, and we won. We were. Uh, also nominated in news and in politics, and that was up against like the BBC, the New York Times, the Guardian, the, like like Salon, like all these. So, I guess my point is, it's kind of like you have to just. Well, Bob is editor is always like, don't be afraid of the foot. Don't, don't listen to the footsteps. You have to go in and, like you said, if you're passionate with something and you have your integrity and you can't be afraid, but it's it's constantly, constantly changing and. And you have to make those adjustments and pay attention to what the climate is. But I think it's not any different in that I think good writing can go viral. You know, good writing can have an audience that you can't have in a, in a smaller uh, forum. And, and it's amazing for us when we can see people logging on, like, you know, logging in from, we did local before, but they'll, you know, see them logging in from China or New Zealand or Canada or like wherever. And, um, and I could also say, like, when we first launched, we, we were more traditional in that we were thinking, um, you know, we were going to have authoritative voices in the field. One of our, we had much longer form. We hired Orville Schell, who is head of journalism at uh, Berkeley, and he did a 
word peace on China. And, you know, when we launched, we didn't have comments. And, like, we didn't have any place for comments. And within two hours, we put up the boxes. We realized people wanted to respond. And, I mean, that's continuing to grow. We're just doing something now. We're probably in the next, in the next month, we're going to launch something where our writers do do more of a, a chat with the, the readers. And, I, I mean, I think that's more along your line with, you know, creating community. Um, so, and then I guess what you're referring, so it's, it's changing and I do think there's all different things. I think you can charge with a wall when it's like business to business, when people have a, an interest, but I kind of think in news it's different because people feel they have the right to know and they can get it other places. And if you do talk to like the Nation Institute, they'll tell you they have like 60 different sources of income. The daily cost is an LLC and they're strictly advertising based and they make their way and then alternate.org they do it all nonprofit and you know mother mother jones is also a nonprofit so there's there's different things right now that you know we're looking at we're right now at LLC and we're looking to possibly go we kind of want to go nonprofit but it, it's complicated <laughs> and um so in in terms of the the books um so in, in in terms of like writers, I mean, I do think that it's the same thing that if, if you want to write, whether you're in grad school or after, just start sending stuff in, and if it's good, you know, I you know, and just because someone something gets rejected one time, the next piece may be the right timing for the publication to publish it. It it might have been that they didn't have kind of the need right then, or the piece seems more special. So. Um, you know, uh, and right now, what what she was, what Gina was referencing is that um, we have a writer who's very, very popular. He's been winning so many awards. I mean, some people think he's arguably the best columnist in the country right now, which is, is Chris Hedges. Has been winning a lot of awards, and um, we had picked him up. He had been at the uh, New York Times. He used to be the bureau chief in the uh, Mid East, and he. Um, he writes for us, and he loves writing for us, because with the New York Times, I mean, there's a lot of satisfaction in writing for the New York Times, but he said he loves to see the way when he writes something, the way it bounces around the web and, and kind of the visibility. Like, it was, at one point, there was something we needed. We were, there was a potential lawsuit there. Something he said, we needed to kind of fact check that what he was referencing was um, elsewhere on the web. and. He was thrilled to learn that the story that we published was like in 1,800 different places. And I mean, he really likes the bang he gets in writing for us. And um, but what's happening now is his his he has a lot of very he makes his money much better with his books. And you know, we talked about maybe doing a truth dig reader or something with the columns that he writes because he's a regular columnist for us. And um, we uh, he's written before books with uh, Perseus and Nation Books, and so they're willing to go. We're going to work with them and take the Truth Dig columns and um, and turn them into a book. And they did, the Nation did this also with the fist columns that they did for the Independent. I think he'll do separate introductions, but it's basically going to be material that's free on the web, but that, that it's going to be reframed and I don't know how, how disguised it's going to be or how how original, but he's going to come out as a hardback, and it's all stuff that originated with our site. So, in that's one thing that I'm doing right now is I was on the phone with them today. But when I say it's all changing all the time, I I had to be candid with them and say, you know, I need a, I need a little bit, I need the weekend to think about sort of what my ask is because I come through the agreements that Chris had made before with them and other people I know that are authors who have made with publishers, but I need to know sort of. Uh, I'm being seen as a media entity, but do we want to hold back any, um, let's say, electronic books where we don't have right now, we're looking at maybe having an affiliate program or, or people that are uh, supporters of TruthDig, do we want to hold back the ability for them to be able to download an electronic copy of this book? Is that something, you know, because a publisher will say, okay, we want a certain amount of promotional copies. So I'm, I'm saying, wait a minute, what if, what are my future needs? That, and they're not written yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm saying that's what I mean by everything's changing. And they do have some agreements that I'm going to look at. They're working also a little bit with the Daily Beast, and they're having some of the same things where they want certain access uh, to on their website. So it's, it's, my point is it's all in flux, and you just 
have to go for it. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, Otis, thank you for your patience. Otis is founder and CEO of Goodreads.com, which you all know. If you've taken my classes, you know about Goodreads.com, right? Which was launched in 2006, and Otis actually got into this business from the other end. He was a software engineer and product manager at Pickle.com. Monster Worldwide also, Monster Worldwide also. He was in charge of lovehappens.com at Tickle. What is that? It's an online dating service. Oh, lovely. <laughs> That's right in the book. A top 10, oh yeah, it's a top 10 online dating service. And he graduated in, with a BS in mechanical engineering from Stanford University, where he always believed he would one day build cars. That's very, very inspiring, Otis. So, can you please tell us, uh, Aside from the fact that you love books, uh, what's, what's the mission of Goodreads and uh, how does it affect the future for writers, writers of books? Mm -hmm. um, so, so Goodreads is the world's biggest social network for book lovers. Um, we're a hundred times smaller than Facebook, but I think we have the biggest audience of, of book lovers on the internet. How many? Uh, Three million registered. That's amazing! Uh, wow. Yeah. If they all gave me a dollar, maybe. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about that. I mean, what is a dollar? Why don't people pay? But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <Right on. laughs> no, I mean it's a mystery, no? Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, you all heard I was. I'm an engineer by background. I'm, I have to come clean. I'm not a writer. I do not ever foresee myself being in the publishing business, but I spent the last three years studying the publishing business, so I hope that I know something about it today. And Goodreads really came about because from 2000 to 2006, I worked in San Francisco at a dot com doing social networking essentially. Tickle did personality tests, social networks, dating sites, photo sharing services. We basically saw cool stuff on the web and copied it as fast as we could and threw a lot of traffic at it. Uh, so when we saw Flare and Stir and Facebook starting to take off in early 2003, we copied them and we built a social network that got up to 80,000 new people a day. For reference, that's about how much MySpace is doing today. Uh, when we saw Match.com getting big and eHarmony taking off, we built a dating service and it became the top 10 uh, property according to Comscore. And, uh, so, so I was just immersed. I got maybe my PhD in, uh, in building internet websites. And when I left that in 2006, because Monster had bought the company and, and was messing it up, and today since killed it, unfortunately. Uh, but, but I was always a lover of books. And to me, books were kind of broken on the internet. Because the only, buddy, the only person doing anything interesting in the space was Amazon. And they basically gave you a wish list. Uh, anyway, so I took my love of social networking, put it together with uh, a love of books, and spent a year from my living room coding Goodreads. And what we discovered was that there are a lot of people on the internet who love books. Uh, in the early days, there were hundreds and hundreds of book bloggers who were just on WordPress or Blogger, just blogging their book reviews. And they quickly found that, hey, if we make it social and put it on a social network, it's even more fun. So I, I think there's still a really big gap in the middle of the book publishing industry today. And that, that gap is, exists in between the writers who are producing the work and the publishers who are ostensibly distributing the work. But they don't really do that, right? They just help you get it into bookstores. They don't help you anybody decide to buy it. And that's really where Goodreads is sitting, is you know, we, we look at our mission, to answer your question, as get people excited about reading. Um, that encompasses both authors and readers. So we have a lot of tools for people to catalog their books, you know, join book clubs online. Some of them are virtual, most of them are virtual, some of them actually exist in the real world too. And uh, so a lot of features around books, but then our secondary mission would really be help writers and authors uh, market their books, which is a problem that publishers are not helping them with, you know, unless their name is Dan Brown. Um, you know, we're working with all the big publishers in New York on their book ad campaigns and we you know, we buy these guys buy ads from us. We run them on our site. You know, we actually have enough page views to make a little bit of dollars uh, doing that. But but what we've learned is they have very small marketing budgets for any book. You know, if you have a dream of I'm going to go get published by Harper Collins and they're going to 
put my book out there and everyone's just going to buy it. I'm going to be a bestseller overnight, not do any work other than write the book. It's not going to happen today. That happened 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, no? Yeah. Not really. Well, I had a guy, Stephen Pressfield. Who's a You're too young. <laughs> Tell me that 10 years ago he could write a book and it would get in the New York Times best book review and it would be a bestseller. Well, 10 years ago that cost $180,000 know. to get in New York, you know, to do a lay down for it a book. Be. Now it's probably 250000 but yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, I just had one. to vent. <laughs> okay, so, so one thing we noticed early on with Goodreads was we built a site for our readers, and I would be cruising the site, and suddenly in the, someone's profile I would say, I'm the author in some big book, and I'd be like, holy cow, this person is famous. They're on our site. We've got to make them special somehow. So this became the Goodreads author program, which is kind of like what bands do on MySpace, right? It's, You'd have a profile, you collect fans, you collect friends, you can blast messages to them. Uh, it's, it's really for authors to promote their work. And we have 10,000 authors in the program today who got an ISBN and are published somewhere. Some of, most, a lot of those are self-published through Google or Author House or that kind of stuff. Um, but some of them are big authors too. And that, that really benefits both readers and writers because the readers are interested in getting new stuff from the authors and they're interested in connecting with their authors. You know, it's pretty cool to be able to go to like Paulo Coelho's profile and like click send a message and then write something to him. And it's also cool to see what he's reading and to see his blog and to be pulling all that stuff. So we're really focused on that problem of helping authors gain an audience, connect to readers, and then you know the getting people excited about reading. I mean that's that's what it is all about. I think if you look at all the all the independent bookstores that have disappeared in the last 10 years, all the newspaper book review sections that have disappeared in the last year, uh, there's a big hole there, right? Who's who's out there like, shouting about cool books they've read? Who's, who's getting people excited? Who's putting social peer pressure on their friends to go out there and read a book? You know, there's, that's the hole I think we're focused on anyway, so that's what we're up to. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, so I, 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 I'm pretty sure as writers we 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 like two things: is to have an audience, people who read our work, whatever we're writing, and to make a living <coughs> from our writing. Maybe not like the grandest. Oh, Bob, you came. Thank you so much. I was going to send you hate mail if you didn't come. But, <laughs> um, Bob is the co-founder and co-publisher of Toothpick.com. That's why that's why we like. Him. Um, so we want to make a living also, and the one question that I have is, and Jim, you're probably in a good position to, to, to gauge this, uh, do people read this stuff online? I mean, we put stuff online, right? Like the LA Times has a book review, online book review section that's like larger than the one in print and, you know, but, but stuff. Does yeah. anybody read them? On book reviews specifically, I mean, they definitely read the content. I, we constantly, because what we get every time we write something, my my most common email is, "I hate you. You're a crazed leftist, <laughs> and the reason I know that you're wrong is because nobody buys your paper anymore." <laughs> and, and then, and then I send back, and I'm not half the leftist of so Bob Shear. Hold a candle to him. So then I send back a message that says, sorry, um, people may hate us, but we have 12 million unique visitors a month, and you know, jerks like you keep sending me this email. Um, <laughs> so neener on you. So yeah, people read this stuff, and uh, one of the great frustrations of our you know, old school print businesses is that you know, the New York Times, something like that, they've got a humongous audience online, but no, and as you all, or many of you know, they're about to try going back to a paid system, which may or may not work. Uh, <clears throat> I think it will, actually. I think they're going to make some money, and we'll see. I mean, the calculation is, can you put up a paid wall? How much can you get? And do you get enough that it makes up for the advertising revenue that you may lose because you have less eyeballs looking at the page if it's a paid page. You see what I'm saying? You're going to get less viewers, so maybe you sell less advertising. But frankly, online advertising, it's an infinite, uh, as they say, infinite inventory. A lot of it goes at junk rates. Uh, 
that I'm probably getting a little far afield here, but to give you an idea of how, how difficult this is in the advertising world, <coughs> our online advertising uh, person was telling me a couple years ago, uh, yeah, here's, you know, here's our ad, and uh, we get $17 for that. That's the going rate. And I thought, wow, every time someone clicks on that ad, we're getting $17. So we're going to be okay. And then she could tell I was too happy about that. So <laughs> she said, no, that's CPM, cost per mil. That's per thousand. And 17 is a huge premium price. Essentially, no one is getting $17 anymore. In fact, most uh, publishers are now getting pennies for a thousand clicks. So that's the essential problem is we the audience, the ad dollars aren't necessarily following the audience because there's so much inventory out there. So, so yes, and you can find an audience, and you know, Otis, uh, Truth Big, everybody here, I think, has found uh, a big size to a huge audience for what they're doing. And the big question is how to how to make it pay. And there, you know, there's there's the charity route, which is very big right now, it's just in San Francisco with a startup there where. I've got a millionaire up there who's putting five million dollars into a new news website. Um, there's there's a paid model and there's advertising. I mean, there's there's a few iterations of those, but those are the three, the simplest three ways of doing it. And and then there are you know sort of gradations within each of those three. But it's not the problem isn't getting the audience. The problem is is it's, we had to learn. We never knew this word in the old days in journalism, but we have to monetize our audience. And the fact I even have to know that is kind of painful, but that's, that's where the business is right now. But news is different from something like a book review or something creative. Uh, news isn't something. creative? <laughs> First it was the short biography. You've got to answer your emails. A walkout would probably be good. You and Bob have that in common. You don't out. answer emails. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, Gina. I should mention that a Truth Dig does have an arts and culture section. We do have a weekly book review, and it's the editor of it is um, Steve Wasserman, who used to run the LA Times book review. And in terms of, um, like I said, you never know when something's going to click or go viral or do nothing. Um, but we have had some very good results with our book reviews, and that there was one uh, review that Shalmer Johnson did, and. It, apparently in the Amazon ratings, it was in like the 300,000 range, and after our review, it went up to 500, and the publisher was like totally crediting us with this. It, in, to the extent that we did a press release and everything, that it had that much influence that it switched their whole marketing. Did it say 500 on Amazon? Because it, three hits can make you go up to 500 on Amazon. Three well, it, it, it did stay, for, I mean, it did really help that book, and it I helped, it, it really like, uh, it, yeah, it, it it made that book um, yeah, sell and everything. So, but sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And and I would say also on our website, a lot of the advertising that we get is from book publishers. And you know, we're not sure if that is with respect to having a regular book uh, review section or if those are just the people. Do you get a lot of book uh, ads on yours? Yes, primarily what we're focused on. Yeah, because. Yeah, um, can you track how many people actually buy a book from those ads or from? No. And no. this is the big problem with book right. ads. Is they're, they're advertising to hoping that it leads to sales, and they have no way of doing it. And if you go ask the marketing manager at Random House, how do you do it? You know, they, they have a little tool that tells them where they get sales in the bookstores, and they just try to like time it. And they try to see, did, a little, did we get a little right. spike in the bookstores in those areas where we were advertising online? Or not, and I look at the Amazon sales rank obsessively, uh, perhaps too obsessively. Uh, but there's no, that, that's the big problem. There's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing if someone sees an ad and then remembers it and walks down the store to the Barnes and Noble to buy the book, and that was the connection. You can't you can't track that. Um, and so that's the problem. You you tell them, okay, we did a great campaign. We got you 200 clicks to your page, and they're like, well, then now what? Did that work? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> book marketing has, has always been famously inept I mean, through, the, through the whole history. I mean, the whole history of professional authorship, it seems to me, has you know has gone through these waves um, with technological change, obviously, but with with uh, related to all sorts of other social phenomena. And the 
the, the, the moment that we're in now, and Jim's right, it's a, it's a revolution. You know, it's a revolution because we see the blood on the, on the streets. And the, and the, and the, and the, Dead horses. And there's not even an interim government at this point, right? There's no, there's, there's, it's not, it's just not clear. So, and book marketers, unfortunately, can't help us. Uh, maybe, maybe Lexus marketers can or some, right? Maybe some other product, people, people who sell products and are very good at selling products. But publishers have always been very, very bad at selling their products. Marketers, marketers that I've worked with have always said we, we don't know. We just you know we try to get reviews, and then fans don't work. We think maybe it's word of mouth. Word of we mouth know, works. We know we know TV works. Uh, Ads work. Ads work. Ads work, but you have to give it a big enough shot. You no. can't put in a hundred dollars and have that work. You know, it's got to be a lot more than that. Yeah, but that, and and Dan Brown gets a lot of advertising. Oddly enough. <laughs> so, for, for the average book, there's there's very little marketing money and there's very little marketing uh, savvy. One, one thing I noticed lately that was interesting is if you, if you look at the advanced jacket copies of books, in the back it will often have the marketing plan for the book. <laughs> and this will say, like, you know, author is son of famous person is going to bank on that to, to get readership, or author is a famous speaker and has or a professor at a college, and they're going to get, so they, they look at that. That, that's, that will help you get published if you have a way already of reaching an audience. Yeah, basically they want you to write the book, to sell it to them for no money, and then to promote it yourself <laughs> on your own time. <laughs> and even after that, they assume that 7 out of 10 books or 8 out of 10 books are going to fail. So why any of them is business, I don't know, publishers. But uh, since since they are, and since we still depend on them, I think the best, uh, uh, the, the only proven way to, to sell a book has been word of mouth. And you would think that the internet is ideal for selling word of mouth, except that nobody really knows how to do that. So you know, the question that I had about does anyone actually read this stuff? Do they read the book? Do they, do they pay attention enough, or is it something they skip over? How do you gauge it? Uh, the effectiveness of your 10,000 authors being on uh, 10,000 authors authors being on your side, or the effectiveness of the schedule you write to you in terms of uh, um, how many people actually sit and read the whole thing, as opposed to just hit it once and skip over it. You can see how if they turn the page and how long they're on the site. So you track that, and they actually. I mean, we don't we don't collect other people's. Um, information, but we can see how they use our site. And you guys, too? Um, I, I say the gauge for us is because is we're a social network, and the primary thing you do is add collected books. So if, if you're an author, you're kind of, instead of trying to drive sales, you're, you're maybe trying to drive people to add your book and market either with an intent to read, which is a very popular thing. You kind of view us as Netflix for keeping it to read this. We've got a queue and people say, oh, that sounds cool, I want to read it. Like, they get saved into the list. Uh, so if you're, if you're out there in marketing, we can't tell you how many people bought the book, but we can tell you how many said, oh, that sounds cool, I want to read it. Can Otis, can I ask you this? So if someone has put the book on their to read list and there's maybe a thousand people who say they want to read that book, but you know some of them aren't going to follow through, can the authors who are part of your service, can they get all those people's emails and then start bombarding them with uh, love letters? Or, that's what I'd want to do if I was one of those authors, right? right. Or, you know, and, uh, seriously, a direct email from the author saying, gosh, I hear you're interested in my book. Uh, you know, if you can, here's a place you can come see me talk about it. or uh, Just a thought. I don't know if you're already doing that. But I, I think the thing about this stuff is, is we're all learning. You have to be somewhat relentless. The author it, chasing the reader. Into well, you've got. I mean, I think you're right. You know, you, you've got to. You've got to be somewhat. Uh, I think everything you're all saying. We you know more about the book business. Like I sit next to Steve Lopez at work, who just had a bestseller. You know, with the Soloist, and some of you might have seen the movie. So he's got Jamie Fox uh, and Robert Downey Jr. in a movie. You think he'd have it made? Well, I'm sitting next to him. I'm watching him do everything you're talking about with a bestseller that's a major motion picture, that's all the things you're supposed to get that, that make it easy. And he's doing a tremendous amount of life work on his own. You know, it's so it is, that hasn't changed from what, from what you're talking about. And, 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 and it's not like there was ever a golden age. I mean, the, I, 
my, my first book was on the front page of the New York Times book review. That was a very slow book week, I assume. <laughs> but, and I assume also assume that the word of mouth was really, really bad because it sold a total of 3,000 copies. Um, this is in 1991, so it's a, it's, it was not the internet that ruined that book. It was my writing, apparently. <laughs> 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 uh, American nervousness. Joanna, you've done some yeah. research about screenwriters and television writers recently. Oh, you want to move on to that? Because I, I was going to say we've done some research about how it is that you monetize audiences in social media. Well, do that and then move on to the We other. just published a report. It's called The Business and Culture of Social Media. It's on our website, theorcenter.org. And we just wanted to be able to give a sort of overview for how the social media universe works and how commercial interests operate there and what the expectations are of users and contributors to social media. And I'm sure these are the kinds of problems that you face with your site all the time when you're trying to balance the commercial economy interests with the interests of people who believe they're operating within a gift economy, where they're offering up comments because they want to, they think they're going to attract friends, they, they bother writing a review of a book because they feel that, well, I'll be contributing to a conversation that makes me sort of a good person, I'm bragging about what I've read, and maybe I'll actually meet some really interesting people, and I'll have a deeper understanding of this book. So there's a certain logic for why it is that people are providing this user-generated content. And you can push only so far in terms of trying to uh, sell products to them, to try to get authors, for instance, to contact them directly. Some people might be really open to that, and others would think, what the hell? This is, this is the hard sell. That's what Facebook is trying to do as well, to figure out how to monetize all of this goodwill. And I think there is an, an overlap, and we actually do have like these circles inside of our uh, illustration, you know, the commercial economy, the gift economy, and there's this overlap between the two, which is about uh, communication between beloved products that are owned by companies and people who love those products. Uh, the feedback that people who have consumed these products, whether they're books or vacuum cleaners or you know, uh, Southwest, Southwest Airlines uh, commentary, that they want to be able to give to the corporations so that they change their ways or adjust things. Um, so I think there can be a lot of overlap between these two worlds, um, but trying to monetize it can be really tricky. I, I, I think it's going to be done. I think there are going to be some really smart solutions that are proposed. I think the key is that we need much more sophisticated in engagement metrics than we have now. We have certain metrics that we use for deciding whether a website or a web product is successful or not. Is it hits? Is it how many comments? Is it how many thumbs up? Is it visits? Is it how long somebody spends on a page? Is it how many pages within a related website? All of these I would think it's how, how much money it makes, if it makes any money, and can it pay its writers? Well, I mean, from our point of view, that's... But I, our argument, I think, is that attention itself spent on something is worth a certain amount of money. Because this, this, this commercial economy, this gift economy, they operate within a larger economy that you could call the attention economy. Mm -hmm. And that attention is actually worth something. Whether somebody buys that book or not, the fact that they spent 25 minutes on Goodreads writing a review of a particular book gives them a certain value as a consumer and as a producer. It provides value to you on your website as a certain kind of user-generated content that you can utilize. It makes the whole site stickier. So, but what uh, does it do for the writer whose work they're reading? Well, it, it's producing editorial content about that book that is available to a global audience. So you never quite know exactly how valuable something can be, unless, like Nielsen has done, which is really terrifying, they've actually, Nielsen, you know, the consumer product research company, has actually put people, researchers, inside people's homes, watched what they were doing on their computers, which websites they were visiting, monitored them for weeks at a time, what TV shows they watched, went to the supermarket with them, shadowed them, saw what they bought, figured out whether they had been exposed to a Tide ad while they were watching uh, a certain TV show and whether they bought it at the supermarket. So it's, it's that kind of legwork that has to be done in order to really figure out 
whether there's a connection between your exposure to advertising and information on the web and on television and what you actually purchase in the store. But people are trying to do that. It's very expensive, but they're doing it. Yeah. Well, back to making money as a writer, though. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Okay, so Jim, would you say uh, we have nonfiction writers in our program, right? They're graduating. Mm -hmm. Should they go look for a job in a dot com, an online uh, magazine or publication? Uh, are they ever gonna? have to give up the day job to, to support that, that reporting habit? Are they ever going to make money for the next 10 years, let's say, from that? Yeah, I think they are. I mean, it's hard to find those jobs, but they're out there. I mean, right now they're hiring at uh, uh, this startup in San Francisco, the Bay Area News Project. They're not going to hire a lot of people, but there are going to be jobs out there. A lot of them are going to be supported by philanthropy. And then people are starting, like the guy I mentioned with the radio, there are people starting local in fact, I'm, I'm getting so many uh, requests now to write about startups for local news. And there are some of them that are actually making money where people, I'm going to go up next week to uh, Seattle where there's a West Seattle blog that a couple, uh, one of them used to be in a newspaper, the other used to be at a TV station, and they, they are just covering the hell out of West Seattle, which is a very plugged in, very uh, tech savvy community. And they're selling advertising and allegedly, uh, from everything I hear about it, they're they're making a living doing their own journalism. So um, the thing about these so far is, frankly, for me, I'm kind of lazy. I like someone just writing me a paycheck and not having to figure it out. But as your folks here, I know at Annenberg, because I go over there and talk a lot, I mean, a good part of what they're teaching now is thinking about ways to be entrepreneurial, and you can't just know how to write the news anymore or even shoot a video you maybe have to think about how you're going to market what you're writing because we've got one in another startup in the Bay Area and here is called spot.us which you go out you have a story proposal you post it on their site you say I want to expose the fact that this city city council members don't live in their districts and therefore they're you know they're not really representing their their constituents because they they all live uh, as councilman Nate Holden used to for those of you who go way back, he lived in Marina Del Rey and was supposed to leave representing South LA. So you put up, I want $2,000 to write that story. And it's working. They're raising some money. I mean, frankly, the stuff, a lot of the stuff that, that Spot Us has produced has been pretty mediocre, in my opinion. But so there are different experiments going on, and uh, uh, I think it's possible to make a, a living there. We're still hiring. Interns, you know, and working them to death, and, and once in a while we, with all for the, the people, online edition or for the for the print and online, they sort of it overlaps, and occasionally, even though we keep laying people off, we if you watch closely, we keep hiring people too. So, and the L.A. Times, little known fact, just to do a little plug, made eighty million dollars last year. So, the fact is, the guy that owns us though uh, borrowed about twelve billion, so eighty million isn't so good. Uh, but, you know, if it was a standalone business, maybe we'd survive. And maybe that goes out a few years. Nobody nobody really knows. So, yes, there are jobs. It's just you've got to be passionate. You've got to really want to do it. And then, uh, you know, I think there there's opportunities. You know, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of things about book publishing that I think are, are pertinent. And it's, it's related to what's happening, happening in journalism. One is that um, as publishers have been gobbled up by bigger and bigger conglomerates, um, the, the kind of push towards blockbuster books um, at, the, at the expense of all others uh, has had a, a kind of predictable effect. Uh, the same kind of effect that you see in the, in the, in the music industry, in the film industry, that when, the, when, when big corporations take over these things, there was a, a famous story about somebody uh, coming into the movie business and saying, well, I, I just looked at all your balance sheets and you had one movie that made $40 million, and you had um, 10 movies that lost money. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to make that one movie. And so the, the, as, as, that, as that happens in each of these industries, all the creative energy kind of squeezes off the sides, and you get independent publishers, you get independent film, you get independent music getting made. And, uh, and we're, in, we're in one of those eras. There have been others, you know, modernism, uh, literary modernism, was it during you know Horace Livewright starts a 
the small publisher. Uh, the small magazines were springing up uh, during the height of high modernism. It's not, a, not an accident. Right? So the, and it was another period when big publishing had gotten too big and too bottom line focused. So, there, so it may be that as, as we worry about various kinds of institutions dying, um, the things that are popping up in their, in their place um, are, are, uh, are, are perhaps better for all of us anyway. That is, the, the, it may be that small publishing um, is, is a better model than big publishing. In the same way that independent film is often a, a, a better, better uh, model than, than independent film for the final product. Uh, the question simply is how, how what, what, what this transition period is going to be like for people to make a living, and how much kind of gross expertise will be lost uh, in the meantime as people don't aren't able to give up their day jobs. Uh, and, and so there's, it's it's a, it's a it's a complex question, but it's there, I, I keep feeling like. Where we may be, you know, it's not just that the LA Times is hiring, but once you get rid of Zell, um, and we can go back to, you know, when publishers can be happy with single digit profits, which can opt for that as they were for, for decade after decade after decade, and which the LA Times and the New York Times were for decade after decade. Instead of it being forced into a double digit profit world uh, of, of corporate growth, uh, perhaps we can get back to a more reasonable world of, of culture and communication. Um, so, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not all. I mean, it's, right, is that part of the issue? Yeah. Keep hope alive. <laughs> <laughs> you pay, Twistic pays its contributors, right? Yeah, we pay our writers, and also, you know, you're talking about what's the measure of success, and you're saying, well, it's necessarily an economic base. I mean, I, no, I think No, money it, and yeah. readership for no, a writer. I, well, it's also, you know, at Twistic, we kind of, we have... A little different motivation. I mean, our tagline is drilling beneath the headlines, and it's not just news. I mean, we have in-depth reporting. We're trying to dig up things that we think are relevant to our society and to our culture. And, and there's also a satisfaction in feeling like you're doing good work. And we do think that writing and journalism and everything is a noble profession. And we don't pay what we used to pay, you know, because many reasons. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we do believe that there needs to be models created that, um, you know, that can support writers and that, that it is important. To, and, you know, when you're talking about what the different measures are, I mean, are you, you know, some of it's that. Some of, are you talking about a living wage? Are you talking about being, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to create an audience which, you know, could be a kind of sensationalistic images or, or content that, that are an automatic hit, you know, if you get like a you know, crotch shot of Britney Spears, it's going to get some hits, you know, but that's not what we have on our site, you know. So I think it's like, um, I, I, I don't, you know, I think you have to define what's important to you and and then, I mean, a lot of our writers, they they... We honor them in paying them, but they really make a living from their books right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, in, uh, we have Most we have writers primarily have editorial to get a job staff. to make a living from for writing. Right, but I do think you know we, we also care about really good writing, and you know, other sites don't pay the writers at all, and it's it's a celebrity what we call or you know. Bible references, sort of thoughts in the shower. It's like, oh, because it's a celebrity, you know, oh, I'm on my way to take a nap. Book. or <laughs> She means help in the book. Go ahead and say it. They also <laughs> share content, right? News content. So, but, you know, so what, what is writing? What is What are your goals? What, I mean, I think that these things are, you know, I think you have to be careful about the kind of blanket statements. And I think it, they have to be clearly defined in your own mind, too, in, in, in your sense of purpose and your goals and everything will it will be helped by clarifying what's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Literary culture has always had those two forces, right? I mean, it's, uh, Samuel Johnson, nobody but a blockhead, writes for anything but money, versus uh, Ezra Pound, nothing written for the market is worth writing. Uh, that kind of double double pressure on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the world of writing something. Yeah. I do. I mean, I sense your pain and frustration that you're addressing because there's the huge trend in our business now to, well, you just write here. This is part of Ariana's deal. She does pay. She has employed 70 or 80 people, though, to her credit. But 
the people that are free, it's you do this, and if you're not already Tom Hanks or Alec Baldwin, this will be so good for you that someone else is going to pay you over here. And, you know, those of us who've gotten paid to write for a living, that gets a little tedious. There, there's a um, scene in uh, Invisible Man where they, they the protagonist, African-American, you know, is trying to make his go in the world, and and they, I forget the exact line, but these, these good old boys who are kind of shining him on say, they send a note with him. I, I can't give you a job, but here, take this note to Joe Bob down the street. And the note says something like, just hope this boy to death and keep him running. So there's a lot right now, there's a lot of hoping to death and keeping writers running. And it's, you know, it's painful. And it's, uh, but the fact is, you know, there aren't as many jobs. And so you've got to, you do have to hustle sometimes. At a certain point, though, I think it would pay to just stop and tell some people, no, I'm not going to write that for free. And if more, if more people did that, uh, there's such a culture now of, oh, it's good for you. It's good. We're going to give you exposure. And a lot of us, you know, are so overexposed that, uh, you know, we don't, we don't need any more exposure. We need somebody to Not me. I mean, I'm lucky. I feel very, believe me, very fortunate that someone still writes a, uh, a check. And I get told every day that I shouldn't be paid for what I do. So, but the frustration that you're expression, expressing is very real and it makes sense because this is, you know, it's hard work and people shouldn't be paid for hard work. So, it's my little rant for writers. If I can make the counter argument to your rant. No, go for it. And, and I, I absolutely sense your frustration in, in the fact that, that that is a problem, but the counter argument to that would be uh, the greatest enemy of any writer is an anonymity. Being anonymous, yeah. not being known. So exposure is good, right? <coughs> if you're going to be a writer, you've, you've got to be known by as many right. people as you can, and then hopefully you're able to translate that fame and, and being known into money somewhere else. So that's why people are doing that. And in, what's interesting to me is that <clears throat> in the physical world, that was harder. But in the digital world, it's the economics are kind of flipped, where you can get known really easily without a lot of money or a lot of effort because you're connected to so many different people. You, know, you can give out your writing for free, and a lot of people will read it, and suddenly you're known. Whereas that's really hard to do in the physical world, because in the physical world, you've got to ship books around, ship newspapers around, and get them delivered. And that all costs a lot of money, which is important to the economics there. So. I think there's a lot of opportunity for a writer on the internet to get a lot of views and, uh, and, and then hopefully translate that into selling books or selling your work on a If you're giving the, con like Sarah Davidson has a novel right now that she's been writing, uh, you know, she wrote Cowboy, a love story and all that. And she had problems with getting this last one published, so she's had it online, she sends chapters out, uh, I don't know, once a month or something. You're giving the book away for free in hopes of what? That somebody will buy your next book? Who was it? Cory Doctor said that books are souvenirs now? Yeah. You, you, you give out the digital vision and hope that someone buys a paper one because people still value the paper one a lot more. And, you know, if, if 90,000 people read your ebook and you get no money for it and you still get 1,000 people to buy it, is that worth it for you? It might be. Or, or you go on a speaking tour. More. I'm sorry. You go on a speaking tour like Tom Friedman of the New York Times, and you charge seventy-five thousand dollars per speech. Of course, he's making a lot on the books too. So, it, you know, the rich kind of get richer. But it is that. We're all getting, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tom Friedman made money from those books long before yeah. he could. You know, yeah. I mean, he won Pulitzer Germany like thirty years ago. So. Yeah, and he's won a lot of them. So. He's an exception, but that is, I mean, a lot of people, the nation, which you referenced, uh, they do a cruise or a couple cruises a year, and they make a lot of money going on a cruise, and you go and hang out with your favorite uh, writers from the nation, including, yes, the man who's ignoring this back there, oh, Mr. Shear. Oh, stop texting in the and middle of the panel. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. He's supposed to be tweeting <laughs> he's out every day. He's a nation cruiser. Anyway, you were saying. Well, I don't want to throw off your program here, but I kind of, these people have been sitting here being tortured. I'd kind of mm. like to hear if they have any questions, unless... Oh, yeah, there seems to be some pent up energy out there. Oh, I'm pent. You take the first question. 
Pick your victim. They might not want to talk to me. I'll go <laughs> right in the front there. Then. Okay, I have two observations. The first is there are a lot of career opportunities for writers at McDonald's. And the second <laughs> question McDonald's is... McDonald's the hamburger. Yes, yeah, selling okay. hamburgers. <laughs> the second question is, none of you yet, this, this is an observation, have convinced me that this is the best of times except possibly Otis. In what way is this the best of times for writers? Look at this title. I think Sorry, one way, you, you? you should say something. You're I like, put that in the title. Yeah, I could give you my opinion, but... Uh, you should speak. <laughs> you need to speak. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious why you put that in the title. Because why I think it's very best of times. Yeah. Well, uh, you want me to make my, my big speech? Now there's going to be more pent-up energy. I'll make it really quick, okay? Because I think that one reason, as Tom said, is that it looks like the, the, the large, large conglomerate type publishers are slowly going to either break down into a number of different imprints or that the, the next wave is going to be smaller publishers who so will publish fewer books but will make, hopefully, better decisions about what they're publishing and who have learned by now that they've got to reserve some advertising money for, or promotion money of some kind for the books that they do publish. So there's a, there's a publisher that published Bob Shear's book or Christopher Hitchens' book, for instance, right? Twelve. They publish one book a month, right? But they actually work on promoting that book, and there's more and more of that kind of publishing. I think for writers, that's actually a good thing. I also think that for screenwriters, for television writers, for poets, for people who don't necessarily get an audience, no matter how much they write, I mean, you could sell 200 screenplays, never have one made, right? That they, the web provides the opportunity to actually show the work. You know, I mean, you could get, you could shoot something on your on your home video camera right now and you still have a hell of a time selling it to a major distributor and to distributor theaters but you can post it online and some of my students have actually done that you know they send me episodes of you know they've got a tv show but it's just online and they send me every episode so from that point of view i think that it is the best of times for writers it's time of transition it's scary for publishers it's scary for newspaper publishers and book publishers but i think for writers there's there's you know ever-growing opportunity. It's kind of the same thing that's happening in music. Anybody mm -hmm. can join the party. You can, you can, anybody can publish a book now, and not only publish it, but have it immediately adopted by the world's largest distributor of books. And in fact, if you want to just do it electronically, Amazon will pay you a 70% royalty. In a couple of months. Okay. Yes. <laughs> in, a, in a way, it's and also, like, if you look at, like, James, like, in L.A. Times, there's only so many slots for new writers, and you can you can publish and you can get uh, your work out there and you know there's much more room, much more entry you know and, and you you could try a lot of different things until it clicks and uh, and it keeps developing like there's the the ebooks you know like I was in discussion with this nation of in and there that that's really growing in terms of um, uh, making money, what, you know, it's like if we're a website or they're also working, doing some stuff with uh, the Daily Beast, you know, they think it's a natural and they're encoding the book so that they figure somebody that's online, if they're interested in buying that book, they may well just download, download that book because they're already online and they don't need to necessarily go to, you know, click over to Amazon or something. All, all these things are developing and I think it is, I mean, one could say, you know, people are writing and reading much more, whether you consider a tweet or something a, a real read is, is a, another topic, but the fact is that, um, that people are are constantly looking at text and it, they're carrying it around with them. I think 25% of news right now comes is coming out of mobile phones. And I mean, there's like, it's developing is my point. But the other so thing is that you, you know, I mean, we didn't have it before. Goodreads and and the like, we didn't have this kind of forum. I mean, people depended on you know little book groups uh, with their with their friends or their you know soccer moms together. You know, 10, 12, 14 people talking about books. Whereas now all this one site has three million readers. Right? That's something that that has been that has been possible only on the web. We also are at the mercy of as writers at the mercy of 20, 30 publishers. I mean, there may be about 30 small and medium-sized publishers, and a bunch of 20-year-olds, no offense to any of you, any 20-year-olds, a bunch of 20-year-olds getting $30,000 a year 
acting as editor and they're supposed to know what's good literature and what's not and right what the hell do they know I mean if they knew if they knew how to write they would be writing Anyway, so uh, you, you're not at the mercy of that. If you really have a book, then it's good. And anyway, they used to publish you with for no money. So you publish your own book online, and even if you don't sell a copy, it's still for no money. But it, at least it's seen the light of day. We're actually going to pause now so that all the 20 something can stage their walkout. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. It's very good job to say. I, just, I, I wanted to ask Joanna a question. You you were so palpably excited about that that virtual tour of the Louvre. Oh my God! And then you and you said that that you saw a different future yeah. for your own book. You said and, and that it, that you were interested in this kind of interactive experience. And I wonder if maybe you were advocating a different kind of writing. Um, if perhaps for yourself even, do, have you abandoned writing, or do you think of yourself as somebody who might? Um, pioneer in some way, a, a, you know, a kind of writing that's three-dimensional and, and interactive. Oh, well, that, that is exactly what I'm working on right now, actually. And I've done a lot of little projects on my own, um, like turning parts of my dissertation into hypertext documents. Um, and But I never published them anywhere. I just saw them as little experiments. But I've been putting together a grant for the National Endowment for the Humanities has a new division called Digital Humanities. And they're trying to fund work where people reimagine the future of the book and reimagine the future of the article. So I've just been putting together a proposal for a series, uh, a bunch of research that I've done on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Uh -huh. I've taken like a sonnet length portion of it and I've done this totally insane historical analysis of it. So, yeah, it's very crazy. It ends up in Cairo, a brothel, and, and anyway. So I'm trying to think of a way to sort of turn that into a, a three-dimensional interactive online experience. And I, and I think the sort of guiding metaphor that I'm going to use for it is a palimpsest, where uh -huh. you can go back in time in layers and layers and the most ancient texts that are being referred to in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which might be midway through this palimpsest, will be hypertext linked through all the audio files that I've collected and the quotes that he's ripping off of in that passage, and then bringing it forward to my presentation of these readings that I've been doing at a literary salon in Los Angeles called Mrs. Porter's, and sort of doing audio uh, uh, um, recordings of those conversations about my research on this poem that all these people know, but they feel is sort of this dead, high modernist giant. So, I, so exactly, yes, that that is the way that I'm trying to take. So, uh, do you see that as the future of of the book? And would you say that the future of art generally is co going to be collaborative, and that there won't be pure sort of vision? Well, well, I think that is the direction that universities are going to take, certainly. And actually, I was just telling Gina, I've been doing these seminars across campus here at USC. People from the sciences, social sciences, engineers, humanities, we're going to go to the health sciences campus next week or the week after, talking about creativity and collaboration and about new publishing models. And in the sciences, they're already doing this. They can drop equations into journal articles so that you can test the, the results right, that the author has claimed with your own data sets. So they're making them very interactive. And I think on the humanities side, they're really trying to do this as well, publishing not just books, but publishing the database of information that they put together in order to make this argument about some, you know, classic Latin poem. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the future. And I think the university is very serious about pursuing this because they realize that the academic publishing model is going kaput. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to be there anymore for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, Chris? I want to just first say that I think this is one of the more important panels happening right now. And I want to connect two things, one that you said and one that Otis said. You said books uh, sell when you can get the word of mouth going. And it seems to me that this is what the internet is all about, about getting the word of mouth going. And uh, I think it was Otis said, asking the question, how do you market what you're writing? Now, I think this is maybe perhaps the future of the writing programs is you learn how to write here, but you don't learn how to market it. And 
perhaps that's what Goodreads is, is experimenting in. I, I am in Goodreads. I get sort of hit by Goodreads. I only open things by Tom Lutz and Janet Fitch because they actually write about what they're reading, and it's fascinating. But now that I hear what you're saying, it's like maybe as an author I should go on there and set up stuff. The fact that people write what they're they're going to read someday, I, I just just watch this over. Do you have a sense for uh, which or any other publishers is any better at marketing their writers' books than others that they know their their uh, business more than the your, others? Is your name Dan Brown or They're pretty good with those guys. Um, no, I, I think there's an interesting thing though. Self-publishing has a bad rap, and probably deservedly so, but it's getting better. Change. And you know, related to what he said, the big picture of the creativity going out of it, they're focusing more on the hits and are not able to focus on those new upcoming writers, the big publishers. So what, what that means is happening is more and more people are going to self-publishing. Um, I, I just learned the other day that Author House, which is one of the big self-publishing companies, makes $100 million a year. Apparently that's more than the LA Times makes. Um, <laughs> So, that was a cheap shot. <laughs> <laughs> because I got to disclose that you know Otis's family used to own the paper. Chandler. You know, if they had the sword, the LA Times would not be in this position. Uh, yeah, let's not get into it. It's fine. It could, it could get ugly here. <laughs> My point was <laughs> that self publishing is becoming more of a viable mechanism. And I would encourage you not to say, oh, I can't self publish because that's, you know, that means I'm not good and, and it's never going to get published. I think the route to publishing now is self-publish. You know, get in every forum on every social network, everywhere you can. Talk about your book. Get an audience. And if you get there, and then you you show the publishers, hey, look, I'm self-publishing. I've already sold five thousand books or something. That will get you in the in the front of Barnes and Noble. Yeah, let me just support that because recently I put my books up on Kindle, and they're selling so much faster than the print copies. Uh, and there's a guy named Boyd Morrison who did something I've never seen done before. Instead of self-publishing his book, he only put it on Kindle, no ISBN number, promoted it. It got such fabulous sales that Simon and Schuster came in and, and gave him a three-book deal. Exactly. I would also encourage you not to not to avoid the, the Kindles and the iPads. And my favorite story is a guy who, who put his book onto the iPhone and when an app store just came out and he had two versions of the book, the first half which was free and the second half which was not. So you got to the end of the first half and it said, oh, go buy this other app for I don't know, four dollars. And it was just a one-off app and that's the reason why books are the most highest frequency app in the iPhone. If you look, there's more book apps than in any other category, it's because that works if you've got good content. That's yes. what uh, Mitchell, all the way from San Francisco, you guys. Be I think this is going to sound very old-fashioned, but I'm kind of horrified at the idea of writers becoming salespeople. And I don't know if everybody is, but I feel like I'm in an MBA program right now, and I'm being told to become salespeople. Oh, wow. uh, to, I'm being taught marketing, and that's awesome for marketers. But what about <coughs> novelists, you know, and people that um, I think would love to have all of this be what what publishing is, right? There's a publisher and an editor and a, a publicist and, and people that are concerned with this and a marketer, but we are writers and that's, I, I just, it's it's really, I mean, it's possible, maybe I'm just not looking at what it is, but when I hear people say, you have to become a, a product, it, I just, I, I, I can't even, I can't even fathom that being my life's work. It's, it's really horrifying to me, I don't know. I wonder what your thoughts are, Tom. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm also incredibly lucky. I have a, I have a job, uh, you know, as a, as a professor, and so I don't I don't have to make a living selling my books. Um, so I write them. If they sell, it's great. If they don't, bad job. So and lots of writers, of course, work as teachers, and that's how they get by. And lots of writers work as you know, TSLE was at a bank, right? Seems was at an insurance company, and Green Cross Williams was a doctor. The, 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 there are lots of ways to get by as a writer that don't require selling your books. And there are lots and lots of great writing that never made anybody live. And 
so that you know where you find your way in this in this in lots of options is, is, is your decision. And I, and I do get I do get a little um, anxious myself about uh, thinking of it all as as a as a kind of as some kind of marketing job. But that being said, I mean, that I'm being not said, it, 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 it's not it's not a bad idea to. Uh, to, to figure out the, you know, where where you want to go with that, and if you want to try to make a living as a writer, uh, then you should definitely get an author page on Goodreads, that's for sure. Oh, that's right. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I feel sympathetic towards that, and that's why we want, that's why we pay our writers, and then places like you mentioned, the, the Nation does a cruise that apparently is their biggest fundraiser for the year, you know, so as a publisher, I am looking at different sources of income in order to support writers, but it, it I mean, this is the, these are the challenges of our time. So, I mean, what they're trying to say is, as a writer, what's the most you could personally do? And that's why they're coming to that. But, the, you know, there are, yeah, some people have other sources of resources. But may I just say two things? One is, one reason this is the best of times for writers is that 10 years ago, if you published one or two or three books and didn't make money from it, didn't sell enough copies, your writing wouldn't see the light of day on the fifth and the sixth because nobody would publish you. Nowadays, at least, you can either publish yourself uh, successfully or you can publish online, even if it's not in a, in a, in a book form, and be read and, and have a readership. So, so this has been a positive thing. But the other thing is I don't look at, at promoting a book as, uh, you know, being a salesperson. This is your life's work. This is something that you put your heart and soul and years of your life into and your passion into. And you can't just hand it over to talk to the 20-year-old, you know, uh, uh, who works at the publishing house and to a bunch of publishers who don't know what the hell they're doing. They have no idea 90% of the time unless you're Dan Brown, in which case he sells the book <laughs> himself because he's Dan Brown. And so you have to defend your own work and defending it means seeing to it that it gets read and seeing to it that it's, uh, that it brings enough revenue so that you can sit down and write the next one and the next one. Uh, yeah, you can be a postal clerk or, or whatever, but should you be? Should you have to be a postal clerk? I, mean, I, no, I, I agree. I think the sales of books is important. I'm not saying readership isn't important. I think everybody wants that who's a writer, but I just wonder if that means we, we can't access, with, with this many people, you know, can't we not be anonymous through Twitter? and use 140 characters to have people know who we are, rather than saying, here, my novel is free, take it. You know, that just seems, I, I don't know, or, or I'm going to sell it in a variety of different costumes, and I'm going to work on, you know, spend That's six months of my life doing idea. advertising. I know, that's right. But again, you've got to uh, slum it through the rest of us. But, yes. Oh, I'm a high school teacher, so I really relate to what you say about writing, yada, yada, yada. And also, I love the Times in Education. It's very popular. Well, um, what I kind of want to know is some hardcore numbers about when you talk about hiring writers. Like, I, I, I'm just curious about salaries, because already being a professional, you know, I'm just curious, like, I, I, I'm no longer 20, and I'm no longer going to work for $30,000. So if I graduate with my master's, what am I looking at in terms of, like, leaving my profession? Getting a job at Truth, yeah, for instance? Yeah, I, I, I kind of would like the hardcore numbers of what are my options. You know, uh, for a range. Uh, let me just answer that because I do on the, on the editorial side. I, I do think it's the best of time for writers, and I don't think you should be a writer. Uh, <laughs> I, I did my best writing when I worked at the post office. I started out, I spent four years there. And uh, I think people should only be writers out of passion. And, uh, and I think it is the best of times because after the LA Times, his father hired me. And his paper then fired me. <laughs> I uh, am now read by far more people. And to a writer, that's what I care about. And if it's nice, if I can make a living at it, if I can't, I'll make it some other way. Teaching is not a bad thing to do. I teach here also. Uh, but so what? The main, the reason it's the best of time for writers is the one you hit on. You will not be ignored if you have something to say. You will find an audience. And these other people can't get in the way. And A.G. Liebling once said, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. Well, the fact is, we own one now. We own one. Somebody can come out of this meeting and say, God, these guys were all full of it. 
they're crazy, sure is full of it, I'll go denounce them. Right? <laughs> and I'll just put him down, you know, and who knows, he might find 300,000 people by midnight that agree with him. <laughs> and, and, you know, with you, it wouldn't be hard. But no, it's, it's a scary crap game out there, I'll agree, but you know, for a writer, for somebody who really has to say something and find a way to do it, there's never been a better time, no question about it. That's fabulous. Yes? I still want to answer her question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Starting, I, I don't disagree at all with what Bob said because I think if you don't really want to do this, there's a lot. It's a lot of, you know, you have to really want to do it now more than ever because there aren't as many jobs. But I, I don't know what the starting salaries are at the LA Times, but I'm guessing they're probably sixty thousand, and there are people making up into the no. No. Okay, someone here who knows says no. They're like twenty thousand. Uh, but. The reporters there tend to make somewhere between seventy and a hundred and something thousand, low hundred no. six figures. No. Well, maybe not in the LA Times Magazine, where one member of our audience worked, but um, <laughs> <laughs> extremely anonymous up here. But I once, when I was disgruntled, this is how I'm getting this number, because uh, thinking that I was not making as much money as people who, you know, we did a little salary survey, and a few years back, I'm just sort of extrapolating from what we've learned back then. Um, and they, the people who did the survey all got raises, so it was like our own little union <laughs> movement because they wanted to shut us up and, right. and have us go away. So. And I'm just curious because being a part of a union, you yeah. know, um, I, I'm just curious because there's, you know, the, uh, in terms of the freelance writing market, there's not a whole lot of powerful union because people are w willing to work for 20,000, 30,000. No, you're not. The freelance writing market is very, except at the high end, is very troubled right now. And you know, there are folks uh, out there demand media based in Santa Monica is paying folks $20 to write 800 words. And, you know, so yeah, it's not a, it's not a pretty thing. And, and they, 15 years ago, the top people were getting to, to, to you know, not just the top people, but uh, your average good freelance writer was making $2 and sometimes $3 a work. And now it's, what is that, 11 cents? I'm not the math. Yeah, it's uh, not much. It's six cents. Yeah. Okay, we can take two more questions, I think, and then we have to wrap it up. Tom, all the way in the back. Oh. Some of us last semester were Can in class. Can you stand up so everybody hears you? <laughs> Some of us last semester were in a class that was a nonfiction writing for the internet class, and um, we did a lot of work on blogs as a way of um, trying to gain an audience online as well. So I've, maybe this is a question for you with Truth Dig, but I, we were told that um, by people that came in that you had to blog very regularly, like every day or multiple times a day for six months to build an audience. I'm wondering how you build your audience your audience online and how how many hits you get if you can share that and how long it took for those hits to really take off and if you all think that writers having a blog is is worth all the work because I mean I find that I spend you know three sometimes four or five hours just working on that on a day and then it's hard to have energy to write anything mm -hmm. else no, it, it is a job we <laughs> um, and I mean, getting back to what Bob was saying is that you have to feel fa passionate about what you're saying. So just, um, I mean, unless you have a fan that are just interested in everything you do. In terms of our own audience, we get about, um, we've had over 35 million people come and we've had, we get about uh, 20, 27 to 30,000 people a day. Um, but it's, um, we... We put up what we think is important, and you know we have we have our site moving. Um, we 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 try and actually not to have it moving too fast because we like to have stuff up on um, on the page and not just get shoved off. But in terms of, um, I don't think that I, again, I don't think that there's like a categorical rule like formula. I think um, you know if you have good things, important things to say. Less often, I think that's better than just filling up space in order to try to build some theoretical, mo you know, some model like um, some formula. You know, I, 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 but I, you know, we've we've run into that a little bit where we have our site, which is a website, and then we have we've had some interns come in and like should should they be spending time on 
Facebook or social networking, or is that taking away from them doing this the site? Um, I don't know. I, I personally, I think it's more important to have important things to say and then get those out there. Like have what you say that's important distributed to more people than um, than just uh, a lot of like fodder. I mean, if if that's the question. Um, we did, you know, we, we in terms of how we got popular. I mean, Bob had his own following, and then different our different writers had different people that um, that, and we just did it on content. We we've had some really important content. We've broken some stories. We broke. Um, Kevin Tillman uh, wrote a story about his brother Pat Tillman, um, and that was on our site, and and. Um, and that was a breaking story that the AP picked up, and the New York Times did a story on it, and the Washington Post. I mean, we, we so we had some significant things that that helped get the word out there, and we're you know we've been able to be credible with that. But um, uh, I don't know where I was. Going. Sorry, I forgot where I was going. To, but I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question well, I, or not. I'd like to address that too. I, uh -huh. I, I know a little bit about that too, and I, I think she's absolutely right. If you're, it, it's got to be passion. You got to love doing it and not mind if no one comes to your blog and you're still writing, because otherwise it's not worth your time. But the, the thing, where you, you, you can't stop at writing and just posting it, right? You've got to think about, OK, I wrote it. Now, how do I get it out there and get people to read it? And so you've got to be tweeting every blog post you write and putting it on Facebook. And you've got to be commenting on other people's blogs who write about the same stuff and linking back to your blog. The more links you get into your blog, right, the more Google follows them and the higher your blog ranks for traffic. And you should also think about writing blog titles with current events. Uh, you know, a lot of people today are talking about some famous person who died, so I'm going to work that into my article that's about painting, because I, I can do that, because you can relate any two subjects if you want to, right? And a lot of people on Google are going to be searching that guy's name, so then they'll find my blog and come to it. Um, there's a lot of tricks like that you should be on dig. You should be on StumbleUpon. There's a massive amount of traffic on StumbleUpon and dig. And if you learn how to game those sites and figure out who are the key contributors, and let me make friends with them and ask them to occasionally post something for them, they'll do that. Uh, so don't stop at just writing the post. Think about, OK, how am I going to get it out there now? Yeah, we, um, we became popular more on content and that kind of thing. But we did, I mean, we, and that was all just word of mouth and different <coughs> connections. And, and we, we made that if someone want to use our material, that they, we asked for live links to our site and, and preferably that they don't post the whole article. But we did um, uh, hire someone actually um, on a very part on a part time basis that came in in November that is into social networking and and there's something called Alexa which is a rating system and. I think when he started, he thought our numbers were very good and that they were over uh, 40,000. That's in all websites. And him just sort of sending out our material, letting more people know about it between November and now, I think we've already dropped to 27,000 and just someone actively sending out our material. So I mean, it. it I don't know that our, our traffic has improved, though. So it's kind of like. I, I'm not. He's. I mean, I think those are great numbers, but it's. It means more people know about it, and and we're rated higher in that respect. But I don't know that it's producing um, more uh, overall hits. So, I don't know. Joanna, I don't want to end the evening without hearing about your uh, the research you did with screenwriting and and television. Oh, writing. oh, yeah. Well, um, there was a great issue of Written By, that's the journal from the Writers Guild that was all about um, the digital world and how writers can go about making a living, quote unquote, doing their stuff online. And it was a marvelous issue and I sort of supplemented it with some other research that I've been doing. But I was just very curious to sort of check in again and see what was going on with webisodes, to see whether anybody was making money on them. Um, so there's a blog on the Lear Center site uh, that I've written, and, and I believe the written by uh, issue is completely online. I really highly recommend that you take a look at it. There's some great sort of how-to articles in there. But it was interesting to see that really the only webisode series that they talked about that had made significant money was The Guild, which uh, is by Felicia Day, and it's about the world of Warcraft. So I think if you have a sort of geeky tech, internet gaming theme to your work, 
it's most likely going to do better in an internet environment. And I've found that certainly with my blog posts, that those are the more popular ones. If I'm talking about digital culture and digital technology, guess what? There's a lot of people interested in digital technology online. So um, she's been so successful with The Guild, which is a comedy about World of Warcraft, that Xbox has actually picked it up and is going to distribute it through Xbox in nine languages. Wow. And the whole thing had just been supported through PayPal, just fans saying, I love your show, you know, and sending her money. Now she's making big bucks. But there's a bunch of other stories uh, in this issue about writers who, I think most of them thought about this when they were on the strike, right? <laughs> and, uh, and the main, you know, sort of one of the big issues during the strike was we want money when the networks are posting our TV shows online. And the networks are saying, oh, that's just marketing, right? Mm. That's not distribution. But of course, they've got ads, interstitial ads, and ads running along the side. So this whole question of what's marketing and what's actually broadcasting and publishing is completely murky right now. <clears throat> and I think for the writers that they profile in this issue, None of them are really making money, but one guy had won a daytime Emmy. They have a special <laughs> Emmy category now for like new approaches to daytime drama. And it was, it's a web series called uh, Imaginary Bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and the way he created, I mean, he's a talented writer who's written on a lot of, he's a professional television writer, but his wife is like a gallant all in the children. And he had this downtime, and so he wrote this funny sitcom online about this woman who has these imaginary bitchy friends. And he, they've got an Emmy now, and now they have to deal with Virgin Atlantic, I think, uh, the exclusive place for imaginary bitches. The only imaginary, the only bitches on our flights are on the screen. <laughs> so they have this whole, you know, marketing program all around these webisodes that they created. So it was, I really recommend it if you're thinking about going into the television industry just to get a sense for where it stands in terms of doing serialized uh, uh, television content explicitly for, for the web. Is that in 2010? And just ago, yeah. Yeah, at the end of 2010. Written by something amazing. Well, Thank you, everybody, so much. You've been so fabulous and, and informative and helpful and gracious. And thank you guys for being such a great audience. And that's it.